Welcome to the uh, start of this next uh, Horaces debate. Thank you. I'm Christian Broughton, editor of the global news website, The Independent. And over the next hour, we'll be tackling the uh, themes and causes and maybe one or two solutions behind some of the greatest challenges facing all of our societies. The big and very broad question for discussion is this. The world is out of balance. How should it be, and indeed, how can it be governed? So what do we mean by out of balance? Well, we're fortunate to have with us today three speakers who can share their insights into a remarkable range of issues to do with the imbalances in our world. There is one issue of politics and government that it seems I can't escape, even in the sunshine of Portugal, and that is Brexit. Um, the once famously stable and predictable British government is currently in gridlock, uh, facing a constitutional crisis and a political crisis that began fundamentally because of imbalance. The established system of post-war neoliberalism and free markets had left behind vast swathes of our society. Here to give another view of the EU is Gerata Hoxha, the Kosovo's Minister for European Integration. While Britain seems to be intent on falling out of Europe, she wants her country to go the other way. So are the old institutions, such as the EU, really the answer to the imbalances we see around the world? Next, we have, from Norway, Princess Martha Louise, who will be addressing how issues of imbalance in politics and economics really start with imbalances in our own identities. These then surface in issues such as gender politics. So many countries claim great success in working towards the equality of men and women, but are we really going far enough, fast enough, in achieving these goals? Her Highness will be discussing not just this theme, but how we can get beyond such issues of identity to address even bigger threats, such as climate change. And finally, we have Harge Geingob, the president of Namibia, giving his perspective from Africa, where the third generation of presidents is hoping to bring a more stable and connected style of government, getting away from the personality cults of the past and building a world of inclusivity, accountability, and trust. So I'm going to invite our speakers first to, in around five minutes, give us, our, give us their view of the subject of governing a world out of balance. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, I recognize my brother, former president of Sierra Leone, Kamara, is here. Uh, I'll go straight to say that Africa had first wave of presidents, founding fathers, very strong personalities, Kwame Krumahs, and so on. That's the first wave. They freed us. Second wave, we, had co we were caught up in Cold War. We had communism, socialism, we were confused, military coups, one-party states. Now, I will say we have the third wave of African leaders who are not extraordinary people, who are ordinary people, uh, who believe in processes, systems, and institutions. Processes and systems and institutions. I will give example when Americans couldn't count, when they had problems with Al Gore and uh, Bush's elections. Process was they are having the process open process to count and so on. So electoral processes must be foolproof and so on in Africa. Then I give example of America where they were struggling that time. And then system was intact. President uh, Clinton was the president. Nothing, no armored cars in the street and so on. If everything else fails, we must have institutions, the courts. So that's what Africa is now doing. That's what we are doing. We have to strengthen the processes electoral processes, governance processes, and systems. And when everything else fails, we go to the court. In my government, those many cases in the court. We don't challenge the court. Courts are completely independent. So governance, architecture must be what Africa is now having. Good governance, dealing with corruption, dealing with uh, exclusivity. In the world context, I believe in inclusivity that spells harmony exclusivity, conflict. So even in a world context, we must have inclusive governance. We must not exclude some people. Women, for instance. In Namibia, we have 50-50 principle. 
that in my party, 50% must be women everywhere. So in government, we have the prime minister, women deputy prime minister, key ministries are having four women, minister, deputy minister, and so on. So therefore, since I'm given five minutes after traveling, I open by saying Africa, new Africa, is dealing with corruption, addressing corruption issues, talking about addressing poverty. We can't have peace when some people are sleeping in hunger. Even in Europe, you cannot be happy if some part of the world is hungry. You cannot be happy if you exclude some people to decide their own future, like those who are still fighting for independence to decide their own future. So you are becoming populist, you want to say, my country first. But I thought we are globalized. And globalization, we must hold hands and move in the same direction to form what they're calling Namibia, Namibian house. Now we say the global village. So let's hold hands and move to there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for opening up there. Um, Your Highness, the issues there of equality and fairness and women as well. I know these are issues that you've been giving a lot of thought to recently. Maybe you can tell us about the balance and, uh, and gender politics. So, <clears throat> I'm not here as a princess. I'm not here as a woman. Uh, I'm here as a human being. And I think we're all human beings. And we have to start functioning as a human race. We are so focused on diversity and duality. Like, I'm so happy you were saying, you know, that if, if we don't have peace in one area, then we should focus on that. And we should feel this whole world as one. I find that all these issues, all these issues that we actually are dealing with in the world today are symptoms of that we are not connected anymore. We're not connected to our soul. We don't feel the earth anymore. We are in a crisis, you know? <coughs> We're in a crisis today. How many of you are scared? Get a hand up. Okay, not everyone. That's shocking. <laughs> Seriously. We have 10 years to get this to turn around. We don't need hope anymore. We need to act as though the house is on fire, because it is. Like Greta Thunberg, the Swedish girl of 16, who has now made a huge difference all over the world because of social media. She's one girl who did not have any power. She's, she did not, she's 16, she's a schoolgirl, and she has managed to affect thousands and millions of people. We're all leaders in this room. We can all do this together. But we have to start with connecting again. And not talk about the symptoms, but actually connecting and feeling who we are and connecting back to Mother Earth. And that is how we can start moving forward. Thank you, Highness. Minister, themes of um, connection there and uh, your specific role within the government um, is specifically about connection and about your, your country's connection to the uh, very big trading bloc um, as your neighbour in the European Union. Um, fundamental exchanges of fairness have been described from Africa and how we need to have fairness not just um, within a continent but also around the world. Um, how do you see the uh, process of connection and fairness between your country and the EU? Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here today. And uh, secondly, it's a very important uh, question that we need to tackle, especially since uh, fairness to be, uh, I mean, in the recent times is one of those values that uh, we keep questioning uh, whether uh, the other side is actually being fair to us or whether we are uh, really responding the right way on 
uh, very important issues that uh, we are now in today's world. So in terms of So in terms of Kosovo and the EU, um, the fairness issue is, uh, I would like to say, uh, from a different perspective. So the way that we view uh, EU or the EU membership, it's not a principle of fairness or not, but it's a principle of actually something larger uh, and something uh, better that we want to be a part of. And uh, in, my, in your introduction, uh, you mentioned Brexit. And I'm afraid I did, uh, yes. <laughs> although uh, it is really, uh, especially for us, for, for the region, it's a pity that uh, we will be losing a very supportive voice uh, because UK was really one of the strongest voices for enlargement in EU. But I think uh, one of the lessons that we all need to take uh, from Brexit is that we really need, especially now, we need a strong EU. We need an EU which will really be uh, the projection of the inception of EU, why EU came to life, which is peace and stability, not just for the Europe uh, and European, mem I mean, EU member states, but for Europe as a whole and larger uh, projection of peace that, and the effects that, uh, that EU has. For Kosovo, EU means transformative force. It means a force which visions peace and stability for the region, especially since, uh, I mean, it's really timely that uh, just 20 years ago, Kosovo was in war. And this June, we will mark the 20th anniversary of peace. Mm. So for us, it's really important that we have a united EU, an EU which stands for values on, upon which it was created. But then also, uh, for the region, it's important that EU keeps the perspective of, EU, of, of membership attainable, credible, and fair. So to go back to the fairness of the process, I think that EU needs to project this fairness in terms of you transform, you reform your countries, and then EU needs to deliver. But sometimes uh, it feels like EU, yes, it is, and it will be the only alternative for peace and stability, long-lasting peace and stability for the region. But on the other hand, sometimes it feels like, you know, this light at the end of the tunnel is constantly moving further and further away the longer that you travel. And it shouldn't be like this. I think EU shouldn't be afraid, especially now of the upcoming uh, parliamentary elections, it shouldn't be afraid to speak up and defend those same values, core values that uh, it, it was created from. So I'll, I'll stop here, but for us, EU is important, and uh, we also hope that you know, this fairness in our relationship will grow stronger and stronger. Thank you. Um, faith in institutions um, seems to be uh, something that connects both your view from Africa, uh, Mr. President, and also your view from uh, Kosovo. Do you think, looking at the EU, um, with the, there's a more skeptical view of the EU, um, of uh, the, the doubts over the, the ever closer uh, integration, the um, arguably the, um, the, the tipping point into recession for many of the economies around the Euro, and the rise of right-wing populism around there. Do these things, um, are these things a deterrent? Does the EU still have an appeal despite those um, currents? Uh, well, I think the question of skepticism is more prevalent or more present in the EU itself and the member states than outside. The view is still more better from the outside. Things still look rosy from, yes. from where you're sitting. Uh, and, and for us, uh, although, yes, we understand that the EU has its own uh, internal issues, the complicated debate on migration, the complicated debate on you know, how the nation states, member states should react upon uh, deepening and strengthening EU, uh, you know, national policies over EU policies, who trumps what. So these are all questions which are debatable, but I think uh, EU and EU member states shouldn't let go of these core values and shouldn't leave space or vacuum uh, to these other more extreme forces, which actually uh, are not interested to 
make EU stronger and more united and more uh, to speak in one voice. Because the stronger we are, the more united we are, uh, the, the greater effects and results we will have in tackling uh, issues which are important to every one of us. You know, uh, we're talking about, the President mentioned gender equality, it's, you know, women empowerment, or uh, climate change is a very important topic, which, you know, uh, sometimes we are immersed in, uh, you know, day-to-day -day issues that we forget that actually it's, you know, one planet that we all share, and we need to really focus and come together to tackle all these different very important issues that will affect us in one way or another. Small states, big states, it will not matter because we will all share the same fate, more or less. But in terms of EU, I think member states shouldn't be afraid of rising nationalism, of rising populism. I think they should tackle it because uh, for us, for example, for the Western Balkan countries, the rise of nationalism in the EU affects us as well. And unfortunately, we have experienced it firsthand, what it feels and how it feels when nationalism rises. And the evidence of that is the horrible wars of the 90s in the heart of Europe. And we cannot afford that. That's why we need really strong EU that stands up to these uh, uh, nationalism rhetoric and electoral rhetoric, which is increasing in, in volume. So we should shut that down. We shouldn't be afraid and we should go uh, prepared in EU elections by really tackling these important issues which, are the, which extreme party, parties or nationalist parties are using you know, to win votes. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, you, um, you yourself mentioned uh, that there was a generation of, of African presidents before yourself that seem to be uh, more consumed with uh, national rivalry rather than standing together um, as a continent. Uh, maybe you can talk to us about how your continent has got, got through that, and now there seems to be this willingness across, as you, as you described, the third generation of uh, presidents to really seek something different rather than national rivalry and nationalism. Well, uh, we believe that unity is strength. And we have AU, we transform our AU, which has basically state-centered, head of states were meeting there, it was more to free Africa. We have now AU, which is basically dealing with transformation of Africa. We are dealing with people, we have uh, Pan-African Parliament, we have ECOSOC dealing with uh, uh, even a diaspora so that we can unite through AU and therefore our address our developmental needs. Africa has to pull its resources both at economic level. We have now political independence. We also have democracy. But people do not eat democracy. Therefore, we have to now address the needs of the people, build the infrastructure, build the clinics, and therefore feed our people. Hungry people cannot eat democracy. And, and to what degree do you look to the established institutions of the West? You spoke a lot about institutions and the need for robust institutions. Do you, do you feel that you look to the orders of the democracy and the, the pillars of the EU and the US and aspire to become like them? Or do you currently look at a gridlocked government in Britain, um, trouble rising across Europe with populism, and in the US, um, the longest shutdown in their history only recently. Do you still think that those Western orders are the things that you want to aspire to? Or is there a new form? Well, I, I think uh, Europe must now, and Americans now, they look, look towards Africa also. Maybe learn something from there. Mm -hmm. uh, Brexit, when I look at Brexit debate, and why the UK would like to leave, EU, and she was talking about EU is very important, but when I'm looking at the debate, are you really uniting Europe, or if I look at Brexit, you are, people want to leave, some people want to leave. Why do you want to leave EU? We would like to have a globalized world, we thought. The blocks like EU, uh, AU, and our American states organization, those are regional blocks 
to harmonize regional policies and approaches, but to then come to global village that we can all live as brothers and sisters. Now you are advanced, uh, are breaking up, that UK is leaving. Now what does it tell us? Is it, is it good to really unite and hold hands? And also when you look in the United States, uh, approach is very different. It's a world power which ought to lead the world. We drew from the climate, you know, uh, issues. The climate change is a reality. People in Africa like us, we feel it today. We have Mozambique, three countries devastated by, by, by cyclone. We never used to hear those things in Africa, but now it's happening. It will therefore call for a world to send together. It's true, people are coming from all over to help Mozambique. South Africa is a very important role. But if we are not going to, as a world, come together, we are now becoming now a little bit more nationalistic, talking about big countries saying America first. Now where are we going to go? A big power doesn't want to open up to help the world, but to first say America first. In Africa, we think we must have a global village. In Africa, we talk about African unity, and then we are supposed to reach out through the United Nations to work together in multilateral system. So, you mentioned. <laughs> you mentioned climate there. Perhaps that's a, a good issue to, to pause upon because you can see climate change as um, a perfect symptom and the struggle of a world out of balance. You, you can argue that climate change and the fossil fuel economies is something that's been um, driven by the West and which Africa is feeling the, the symptoms of very directly. You just mentioned Mozambique. Do you feel that um, around those bigger, broader global challenges, and nothing can be bigger than the global challenge of climate change, surely, um, do you feel that um, Africa gets a fair deal, gets a fair hearing from the other global powers such as China, the US, the EU? When you're dealing with these larger trading groups, um, is it always a, a one-sided debate there? Can a smaller country stand up to them? Yes, uh, Africa is not small as a continent. Individual countries like Namibia may have a smaller population. We're talking about 1.2 billion people. That's not a small population. No, of course. We need to unite and pull our resources, and the world must recognize us for what we are, not just to come for our raw materials and then take them up instead of adding value and holding hands so that we can also industrialize and catch up with the fourth industrial revolution. There's a lot of investment from, um, say, China into Africa. Um, do you feel that there's a, is, is, that a, is that a good uh, future for Africa to, to, is that a good way for Africa to build its future from that kind of overseas investment from the big powers? We are living with Europeans, not with China. Chinese are newcomers in Namibia, South Africa. We have white population, we have Germans in Namibia. They own land, they own commerce, so we are used to Europeans. We grew up with Europeans. We were born at the same farms with white people who are Europeans, not Chinese. So Chinese are newcomers. But we must hold with our own brothers who are with us. We were born. I was born at a white man's farm. And there was another boy born there at that same farm. Now, we are both Namibians. But he has a land. He came from Europe, but he has a land. I don't have the land. So that's the thing we have to address first. Leave China out first. To come to China. <laughs> we have that problem there. Who controls the commerce in Namibia and South Africa? White, white people, not Chinese. But we are brothers. We, are, we say we are Namibians. We must hold hands. We are doing that. We have reconciled in Namibia, I must say that. When we got independence, a divided country, apartheid was there. But today, when you go there, you will see we are one people. But one when you come to political side, because we a political power, we have reconciled. But at the economic level, the white brothers who have economy and land must also meet us up. So we can have, you can only have people having peace and harmony if they are all enjoying economic benefits. So China, okay, we are open to 
the world. I said Namibia is a child of international solidarity, midwife by United Nations, friend to all enemy to none. So we are open, we are trying to provide conducive investment climate. Chinese can come, you can come. Chinese taught me one thing when I was telling them, comrades, what is, coming, what is happening? I see all these capitalistic uh, luxury things here. And I said, now we open up our country, everybody can come, but, he says, whoever comes here comes on our terms. Now people go to Africa in their terms, on their terms. Now Africa must also let people come on our own terms. Whether they are Chinese, Germans, or Americans, they must come on our terms. Johannes, I know that um, climate is, uh, is, is an issue that, um, that, you, that, that you hold dear, um, and you have been thinking a lot about the, the, the inclusivity of the world. Uh, maybe you can pick up on those themes and tell us how you feel the, the urgent ticking clock of climate change can best be addressed. Well, well, we need to do, you said earlier, we need to do something now, but what is that thing we all need to do? Yeah, that's the question, exactly. Uh, I think we all need to sit down at the same table and talk through that and get over, like, exactly like you say, we're brothers and sisters. We need to sit down as that. We need to get over our egos of this versus that. I'm better than you. I have, I'm right. You're wrong. Um, this duality that's in our societies and, and that keeps us from moving together. I mean, I think we must be the most stupid species on Earth. Because we are ruining our livelihood and we don't seem to care, like on a global scale. We're not like frantically going, listen people, I don't care where you're from, I don't care if you're man or female, I just, you know, like we need to get together to fix this because this is going down the ship, you know, like we're going to be extinct. Um, and it's like we're, we were discussing earlier today, like it's like a bit like Hollywood films, but at the end, somebody will save us. You know, it's all turning out in the, in the end. But if we don't take action and we don't sit down together to make a solution for everyone, for all of us, not just for me or for my country, or for my region, but for the whole world, because this is for the whole world. I was invited by my mother uh, last um, summer with our family to go to almost the North Pole, which is an island group called Svalbard, uh, which is a Norwegian island group. Um, and it's almost literally on the North Pole. And even there, where it's the most pristine nature, there's hardly any people who's been, uh, been there uh, or live there. Still there, you know, all the glaciers are retracting. The polar bears are threatened to be extinct. And it's happening all over the world, and we don't seem to care. Some people care, but not enough of us. <laughs> And it should create a unity for us to panic and sit together, and this is a dire straits situation that we need to solve. Again, we're all leaders in this room. We can do something, people. Let's have some action here and not just talk. I wanted to allow the, um, for the last uh, 20 minutes or so, if there are any questions from the um, audience, so uh, we can either continue the discussion or by all means we can take questions from the floor, please, yes. If you could um, let us know to whom your question specifically is addressed and uh, where, maybe where, you're, you're, where the, the, the body you represent as well, that would be great, thank you. Yeah. 
how do we expand disability access beyond just physical access, but to include all the disabilities? And I would even love to know from Kosovo. That's a very good uh, other dimension to a world out of balance. There is the, the lack of balance between the uh, opportunities for those who are able-bodied versus those with disability. Mr. President. Well, uh, in Namibia, we have policy. We have also a ministry dealing with disability. Uh, we are definitely addressing the requirement when, as a prime minister, all buildings must be uh, friendly to disabled people. Uh, definitely, they must be employed and go to school. But it's still difficult because we are a poor country, let's say, that Africa. And if Europe can lead, we can follow. But definitely, policy-wise, we are we are we are at it. Well, so, and the, so the, the question specifically the question, is what, what, could, what could happen next to, 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 to move the world together, I suppose, rather than just um, uh, some nations such as the US? I mean, maybe you mentioned um, um, other, other, other nations as well. Yes, if, if you, you else mentioned Norway and, and, and that we have technology for this. And yes, we do. Although on other parts, we're very far behind as well. Like pavements for wheelchairs is much better in the US than in Norway. We don't have uh, all the trains or the buses for disabled people. Um, and uh, it's important that everybody becomes equal, uh, however they represent themselves. Um, so, yes, even, even, you know, <sighs> yes, there is a lot I mean, of I'm, issues we need to... I'm just conscious there are some other hands yes. going up, so uh, thank you for your question. Just the, the, the gentleman in the blue tie up there, please. I have a great question for uh, and I'm excited about the question for... Uh, You refer to crisis, you even refer to the risk of human extinction. In the diet of the presence of nuclear weapons, development of post-nuclear weapons like killer robots, pathogens, space weapons, on a scale of 100, what do you think is the risk of human extinction in the next few decades in the present world? Well, that's a, not the most optimistic question we could have had from the, from the audience. Can you repeat? Excuse me? Can you repeat? I think the question was, um, how great is the threat of human extinction? That's what you wanted to know. Is that how great is the... The threat of human extinction. We, we spoke about, for instance, climate. Yes. Well, Mr. President, that's interesting, actually, because you said that Africa had gone through various generations of presidency. The, 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 the third generation, you hope, is about coming together and getting beyond the, uh, the kind of character 
politics of the previous order. How, how are the nations of Africa coming together and putting their differences aside and working together? Could you give us some examples from your experience of how you've worked with um, countries which previously have represented conflict to get along? Well, Africa is moving, pulling in the same direction. As I said, we have transformed OAU, which is to be to free Africa, it was, uh, to support liberation of Africa. Then we entered the for transactional. After we got independence, we have flags and, and national anthems. He didn't say what after independence. Now we are saying we have AU, which will be a transformational organization. Being transformational, it is addressing people, not only head of state and so on. Therefore, we have a Pan-African Parliament, we have ECOSOC, and we are dealing more with economic integration. Because we are saying freedom is now here, we are free, we have democracy also in place, uh, but economically, we are still behind, and therefore we are saying Africans must trade with, among Africans themselves, in the African trade is very low, but we must also industrialize, and by having conducive investment climate, in most of Africa, if not all of us, we therefore have a way of having a trans-Africa kind of cooperation. Some countries would like to support Botswana and Namibia to build roads, for instance. That's very easy, that's, that's much better. So Africa now is addressing the question of poverty, question of inequality, and we try to develop ourselves. Of course, national disasters like what happened is not expected. Climate change was not expected. But still, because we have peace, and therefore we are pulling in the same direction. As I say, we have now signed a uh, continental trade uh, regime, ratified now, so that we can train, trade in, to have intra-African trade. We are just looking at Europe or outside and so on. But Africans have to hold hands rightly. You said they don't have wars. There are still some problems here and there. But Africa would like to have holes and move, hold hands and move in the same direction, which we are doing. Thank you. Could we get the uh, microphone over? So the, the man in the glasses there with the blue tie had his hand up there. Do we have the microphone ready? <coughs> then we'll go to the lady two rows back, and then somebody down here had a question as well. Uh -huh. Thank you. Unfortunately, it's not my place to uh, talk on behalf of Norway. Um, but again, we need to discuss these issues together. We need to sit down at the table. And everybody has to have equal rights of what to express ourselves because we're all human beings on this planet. And we all need to find new solutions. And we have to go in the depth of our souls, I think to find the core of what is the problem here and to overcome our egos. So, first of all, I think that we need to reconnect to who we are. We've, we've totally got lost in the whole process of being right and thinking our way into the future instead of knowing our way. Because when we know, when we're in contact with our source, our soul, our core, then we know, and that is already aligned with the whole world or Mother Earth. And we can't go wrong in that setting. But we have detached ourselves from our empowered way of being. 
And in that way, we have chopped our heads off from our body in a certain, if you say it like this, and our intelligence has spun off in a certain direction and is not connected to our core anymore. And therefore, we need to reconnect to our core, and then our intelligence can solve these problems when we already have that core issue. Um, and I think that's the way we have to go. We have to remember who we are, and we don't. Thank you. I just had the signal we've got the last 10 minutes here. Maybe somebody who has a question for uh, the minister from Kosovo. Um, is that... Oh, so, I'm sorry. No, okay, fine. But you've had your hand up for quite a while. Sorry, yeah, the, the lady two rows back. Thank you. That's a great question and a much more, much more hopeful and positive thought as well. Um, <laughs> we've gone from human extinction to uh, the future. Maybe you'd like to take that one up, Minister. Well, uh, a world in balance. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it, as you said, three key words, so we'll, we'll have to really think sharp about that one. So a world of balance, I would, in my view, would... Uh, be economically balanced, first of all, so we wouldn't have this great gap between uh, the rich and the poor, especially also uh, between uh, the countries, but also human-wise and individual-wise. Uh, so that, you know, more economically balanced than uh, gender balanced as well, because uh, we've been discussing here in our panel, but also elsewhere, how uh, a world without uh, gender equality and gender balance or women empowerment is actually uh, making lots of countries uh, stagnate because half of their society is actually not participating in their economies, in their societies. So uh, it would also have to have this concept, a world of imbalance in addition to the economic uh, balance. It would also have to need to have uh, women equality or, or gender equality, let's call it that way. And the third uh, element that I see, uh, a world where education is accessible to everyone, because that's the basis of each of the foundations. So economic power, gender equality, education, would anyone add to that list? Well, we need peace. Peace as well. A question um, to pick up on then, uh, because there's been a lot of discussion about the, the various blocks, so Africa's strength together and uh, Europe's strength together. How much can the big, can the kind of established order that's being rocked at the moment from the US to, the, to Brexit uh, and everything else that seems to be uh, quite negative at the moment, how much of these old institutions, as you were discussing, Ms. President, how much of those institutions the answer? Um, well, Kosovo is... Uh, I think a great example where we saw that uh, how when countries come together, when uh, powers come together, actually uh, wonderful things can happen. And uh, in fact, not just Kosovo, but the region. But uh, I'm, of course, here to speak about my country. Does it so, feel like a different world compared uh, to 20 years ago? It must have, I mean, such a, the, an a, amazing pace of Well, pace. yes. 20 years ago, U.S., a uh, led coalition together with uh, EU member states, uh, they stopped the war. And then they supported the country, they supported the region to build uh, the peace, to stabilize the region. So, uh, and then we also saw many different international organizations, namely also uh, United Nations in Kosovo and then EU uh, rule of law missions. So we, we saw, you know, different international governmental organizations which actually have played a great role. And not to forget, of course, NATO, which is a very important institution, which uh, in addition to EU membership that we aspire, uh, we also aspire NATO membership. So I think, you know, in in addition to the role that the countries individually have to play in this bigger picture of the changing, ever-changing world, uh, I think that we also need to strengthen the international organizations because they also have a, a, a great, important role to play, especially in tackling key 
issues which we are uh, discussing, like the climate change, uh, economic uh, empowerment of, of the countries and, and bridging the gap between, or developing uh, the countries, giving them the instruments to, to develop. So I think it's important, and we've seen this firsthand in Kosovo, how when uh, key powers, US, EU, come together, really good things can happen when they speak in one voice. Excellent. Um, gentleman with the red tie. You can, yes. so can we just wait for the microphone? Who has the... Sorry, somebody should be bringing a, a microphone to you. Okay. Can, can we all hear? Yes. I'll repeat if, if needs be. Okay, so the idea is uh, like this. Uh, Mr. President, you mentioned the possibility in the future of uh, an African Union. Uh, in the future, I think that the global world will look something like this. Uh, the big table will say like the States and China, which will take the uh, important decisions. The same big table, European Union and Japan will say, but only will think that they are part of the big decisions. India will dream about saying that, that big table, and Russia will want to say that, that big table. How do you see the position? and the place of a possible African Union in this global framework. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Can Africa really compete? I will say I'm building what I call Namibian House. And then under our constitution, under our constitution, Namibian House, where all Namibian children will live together and pull in the same direction. Africa under AU will build African continental house. And the world will build on the United Nations global village. That's how we are all going to come together. So Don't first despair, by working with the world EU. is not falling apart. We'll have United Global World under United Nations multilateralism. Not unilateralism. That's the world I see we're going to have. And don't despair. We are building that world. Over on the left here, if we can just get the microphone over to the far side of the auditorium, up there. So sorry, the, 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 the specific question there is? Is it, is it time now for uh, emerging market leaders to stand in this traditionally divided American, European, uh, homogeneous uh, uh, leadership? So how can the emerging markets really assert themselves? Um, and who's your question specifically directed to? Oh, okay. Mr. President, can the, can the emerging markets really uh, assert themselves and take the control of the big financial institutions? Is it really well, going to happen? Well, let's start with reform of international institutions. My brother there has been busy, busy trying to reform the United Nations system. Unless we can reform those systems to be inclusive, how do you leave out 1.2 billion people of Africa out of the table where you are taking high decisions in security council. Absolutely, there's a question. These are the things. Nonetheless, they, so we have been fighting they do for seem that to be left right. out. How do you be, I said exclusivity spells conflict. Inclusivity spells harmony. Now you want to leave out Africa again from that table. People of uh, 1.2 billion. So that's why we are saying we have to reform international institutions to be inclusive so that we can have harmony and live in a global village. And from your perspective in, um, in the east of Europe then, do you feel that enough power resides with the small countries? How can the small countries really take control there? Well, uh, as single countries, it's not that we have you know, power. But then uh, 
when you join EU, of course, you know, each member has one vote. So that's when, you know, your power amplifies. And, and of course, you have uh, interests or joint interests between the countries where you can also create a, a larger...